two months of Thanksgiving <coughs> to make sure, number one, your wages are directly deposited into your bank account and that no one outside of the household is contributing to the household expenses. We need to prove to the lender and to the underwriter that you can afford the home that you are applying for without any outside financial help from family or friends. So any lump sum deposits, any lump sum withdrawals that we see in the bank statements, we will have to write a letter of explanation explaining where that money came from or where it's going, and we will have to source it. Uh, so say for instance, if you get a gift from family, we will need to get a copy of the council check along with a letter of explanation to explain well, these, this money came from my sister to use for the purpose of my own. Okay? We can't use any undocumented, unsourced income in those two months of bank statements that you give us. Uh, we will also need those bank statements to, to, to ensure that your down payment, if there's a down payment requirement or closing cost, we need to make sure that those funds are available.
So if you look at your pay stub, right, you get paid every two weeks, every week, uh, the first and 15, once a month, you want to look at that gross income, if that's the amount that is reflected on the pay stub before any taxes are taken out. So you want to take the gross monthly income and multiply it by 0 0.40, so it's 40%. Gross income times 0 0.40, and whatever that answer is, at that point you want to subtract all of your monthly obligations, which will be your car note, your student loans, your credit cards, not any utility bills, but anything that's reflected on the credit report that has a monthly payment that's an active account monthly payment, you'll need to subtract that. And I wish I had a dry erase board, but I don't. But if the gross income times 0 0.40, Whatever that answer is, then you want to subtract your card note, credit card, student loans, anything that's reflected on the credit report. The number that you come up with, once you subtract all the monthly debt, is the maximum mortgage payment that you can afford. Yes, sir. Would you subtract your current rent, monthly rent? From no, that? no rent, just the things that are reflected on. Well, some, I have pulled some credit reports and I do see their rate on there, um, but no, because the rent will go away and your mortgage will kick in. Okay. So you don't want to include that. You don't want to include any lights, water, gas, cable, any of those things. Just credit cards, student loans. Uh, we'll talk about student loans a little bit later. Credit cards, student loans. Um, What's reporting on your credit Yeah, any other okay. loans that you may have as well. You want to subtract the monthly payment on it. The minimum monthly payment. Not what you pay, but the minimum required monthly payment from that creditor is what we will come up with. There's also a housing ratio, what you call the front end. So some, some lenders may say your front end ratio and your back end ratio. The front end ratio is basically how much you can afford based on your current income. Not even talking about any monthly debts. So if your, your gross income is $3,000, you uh, multiply that by 0.30. So some lenders will go 30% on the front end. And whatever that answer is, that's the maximum amount of mortgage payment that you can afford without any debt. But I really focus on the debt to income ratio, especially if you have more than 10 months remaining on that debt, like a car payment, you know you got a couple of years left to pay on that. I really focus on the debt to income ratio. Uh, but we do have to look at both the front end and the back end, which is the housing ratio and the debt to income ratio. All right. And we talked about that. The monthly mortgage payment, minimum payments on credit cards, car payments, you know, student loans and other installment loans. No utility bills, no car insurance or anything like that. <coughs> Alright. The debts you do not pay utility, car insurance, child care, all of that, that's not a part of the debt to income ratio. Another term you will hear that's called loan to value. Hopefully, your loan officer won't use a lot of acronyms. We really try to use the acronyms for people that work in the industry. So if by chance your loan officer say, oh, well, the LTV, blah, 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 that they're talking about the loan to value, okay? It's the amount that the customer is borrowing, expressing the percentage of the sales price or the appraisal amount of that home. So for example, if the sales price of the home is two hundred thousand, you schedule the appraisal, have the appraisal done, it appraised for two hundred thousand, and the loan amount is one hundred and sixty thousand. Your LTV will be eighty percent. So in most cases, um, if you're going to do a regular conventional loan where you bring five percent to the closing table or twenty percent, whatever percentage to the closing table, you're going to have the asking price of the mortgage then you're going to have your down payment. You're going to subtract your down payment from that. Then the, the remaining balance is the percentage of loan to value. Okay? So say, for instance, your home is $100,000. You're going to bring 5% to the closing table, uh, and you're going to finance in $90,000 of the loan, or $95,000 of the loan, then your, um, your loan to value will be 90, 95%, or your LTV 95%. Same here in this example. The sales price is one ninety five five. You get the appraiser done. The appraiser said, "Oh, it's more than it's worth more than what the seller is selling it for, so it's 
almost worth two hundred thousand. Uh, the loan amount is one hundred sixty thousand, so you're looking at the loan to value at eighty two percent or LTV. You may hear LTV, but that means loan to value. Okay. The the amount of the loan compared to what the value of the house is. Any questions about that? I just want to make sure that everyone is clear on LTV or loan to value. Like I said, we try not to use acronyms, but we 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 use these terms over and over again, day in, day out, several times during the day. And you may hear somebody say, well, the LTV or the PMI and all that stuff. That's the purpose of this workshop. So you will know the mortgage terminology that we use, okay? The next thing you will probably hear, I'm sure you will hear as you're going through the home buying process, is PMI. I'm sure you're gonna hear about that a lot. PMI, PMI, PMI. And some people may even say MI, mortgage insurance. Basically, PMI means private mortgage insurance. And some lenders take off the P and just say MI, which is mortgage insurance. Private mortgage insurance is an insurance, an insurance that you pay that kind of protects the lender in the event that you default on the loan. Insurance is usually done on conventional loans when the loan to value is 80% or higher. Now, if you're going into a mortgage loan with 100% financing and they have private mortgage insurance, once you get to 79% loan to value, your private mortgage insurance should fall off. Um, make sure you keep an eye on it. Um, the lender, we're all human, so we may make a mistake and we may not have the private mortgage insurance to fall off at the appropriate time, so just keep your eye on it. Once you get around 80%, 79%, you really need to be calling the lender and say, hey, my loan to value, you know, I got it on 80%, let's go ahead and have that private mortgage insurance removed. Now, on FHA loans, you have private mortgage insurance for the lifetime of the loan. No matter what the LTV is, you're gonna have that private mortgage insurance. Here at Regis, we have several loan options with no private mortgage insurance. The 97% of affordable 97% loan has no private mortgage insurance. Regions affordable 100% financing has no uh, private mortgage insurance. And you really save money in the monthly payment. Your monthly payment can be anywhere between $60 to maybe $150, $200 less if we can waive or remove that private mortgage insurance. If you're going regular, regular conventional, you want to make the down payment to have the private mortgage insurance removed because once you make start making those private mortgage insurance payment over a period of time, it, it's going to add up. <laughs> it really adds up, and you don't get that money back. There is no refund on the private mortgage insurance. So if you made all on-time payments on that private mortgage, I mean all on-time payments on your mortgage payment. You're not going to get the refund back on the private mortgage insurance. So if that, if you can possibly do it at all, just go ahead and have that private mortgage insurance waived, and that's just bringing a substantial amount of money to the closing table uh, to avoid the uh, PMI. Now I know regions, uh, you know, we do have, like I said, several loan options without private mortgage insurance. I'm sure other lenders have those programs as well. You definitely want to ask for those loan products when you go to your lender and say, hey, do you have any loan products maybe 100% down payment with no private mortgage insurance option? You definitely want to uh, do your homework on that. Of course, you know, you have your government loans, you have your, your Fannie Mae, your Freddie Mac, you have your FHA, you have your VA, you have your USDA or what they call rural development loan, you have your uh, bond loans. All of those are government backed mortgage mortgages there they have strict guidelines on everything on as far as the documents you provide to us as far as what is acceptable income and unacceptable income um, it's, it's 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 in black and white and all lenders have to abide by those government um, guidelines there's no wavering with that okay you will also hear a term called conforming loans. 
And basically what conforming means that we have to basically conform or abide by the uh, government guidelines, the mortgage loan or the, the loan amount cannot exceed 484350 So a lot of those homes you see way out in West Little Rock that's $500,000, $600,000, those are not conforming loans. We call those jumbo loans. Uh, so basically, it's, it's backed by the government guidelines. And basically what that means is in an event that we need to sell or transfer your loan to the financial institution, we can't because your loan has been originated per the government guidelines. So let me explain that. It's just a part of the lending industry that your loan can be randomly selected to be transferred or sold to a government organization and then they pay us back that loan so we can keep lending to other people. So it's like a big pot. We'll give you the loan, you may start off with Regents, you may start off with Bank of America, your file may be randomly selected to be sold to another financial institution they will pay us for your loan so we can continue to lend to other people. And that's just the nature of the lending industry. Just like student loans, it may start off with Sally Mae, then it may go with Navian or Great Lakes or whatever. Basically, your file is being transferred or your student loans are being transferred or sold to another student loan provider so they can, in return, pay Sally Mae back so they can continue lending or giving student loans to other students. It's just the nature of the lending industry. I just wanted to make sure you guys understand that it has absolutely nothing to do with your income, your credit score. It has nothing to do with you. You have no say, no power in that. It's just randomly selected to transfer or sell your loan to another financial institution. And like I said earlier, non-conforming loans, or what we call jumbo loans, are loan amounts that are above 484350 okay? Okay. Interest rate, and 
that's what you call an adjustable rate. Each year or every five, seven, ten years, they will increase the interest rate. And then you, you just have to do the manual calculation to see how much your mortgage payment is going to change. All right. They are beneficial for people, very beneficial for people who only plan to be in a home for five years. When I purchased my home, I knew <laughs> that I probably wasn't going to move again. So I wanted to make sure I get the lowest interest rate possible to keep my monthly payment as low as possible. All right. So with our Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans, those are going to be your FHA loans, your VA, your rural development, all those loans follow up under this Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Freddie Mac uh, thing. So what happens is we have to send your information to a portal to get the uh, pre-approval and approval on your file. They call it desktop underwriting. So when you give me um, basic information about yourself, you know, your first and your last name, your date of birth, your social security number, your credit, uh, your social security number, and I pull your credit, then I take all of your information, of course, your pay stubs, your bank statements, W-2s, and all of that. I put it into a creative file, and I send your file through what's called desktop underwriting. And within seconds or minutes, I will have what's called an eligible, if you are approved eligible for that government back loan. So it's not like your file go to an actual underwriter, a live person reviewing your file. That doesn't happen until later on in the process. But hey, if you come to me tomorrow and say, hey, I want I found this hope that I want, I want to apply for a VA loan or a uh, FHA loan, I'm going to ask you, you know, some general questions, of course, about your asset, credit, and income. I'm going to, um, Get your social security number, date of birth, and all that, pull your credit report, and then I'm going to send your information through this portal, and then I will know within 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, whether you are approved eligible for that government loan, the FHA, VA, rural development, or bond loan. There are some manual underwriting where a live person have to review the file and pull out their calculator and see if you can actually afford to repay back the loan. But with most government loans, or all the government loans, we have to send it through desktop underwriting. Okay. Closing costs. I know most of you all have heard about closing costs. Um, we really, believe it or not, we really try to push the seller to contribute funds toward your closing costs to uh, remove some stress or you know, alleviate some stress on you. Uh, because if you have a down payment requirement and closing cost requirement, it could be a lot of money. But let me tell you what's all included in your closing costs. Discount, uh, discount fees, or what we call discount points. If you are wanting to lower your interest rate lower than what the national interest rate average is, you do have the option to do that. Discount fees, that's a part of your closing costs. When I pull your credit report, you don't pay anything up front, but at the closing table, you will pay uh, for the credit report that we pull during the initial underwriting review. There's a flood certification that takes place. So once you identify a home, we just need to make sure, ensure, or determine whether your home is in a flood zone or not. If your home is in a flood zone, of course, it requires an additional what we call flood insurance, okay? You have your loan administrative fees, that's gonna be your processing fees, uh, un, uh, loan origination fees, all of that is associated with that. Then you have your tax service fee. Um, you know, of course we have to report to the uh, county's assessor's office that you are now the owner of this property. There is a transfer of ownership fee taking the home out of the current owner's name and put it in your name, there's a fee for that. And all the steps, the legal steps, and all of that legal stuff, there is a fee for that. Then the appraisal. Now with regions, you do have to pay the appraisal up front. Now on the average, it's about $500 for the appraisal. You'll pay that up front. Then you normally see it credited back to you at the closing table, but you're gonna pay it up front then it's also part of the closing cost that you have to bring to the closing table. But since you pay it up front, we're going to credit it back to you 
on these documents, you'll see where the appraisal is credited back to you. You have the closing fees and the recording fees. All of those fees can make your costs. I mean, your closing costs could be anywhere between, oh, they could be anywhere between, you know, a thousand dollars, maybe up to twenty-eight hundred dollars, depending on uh, how much <coughs> those fees are. So it's it's basically on an average of how much you're going to pay on the closing on the closing costs. We have the quick loan reference minimum down payment requirement maximum loan amount. Uh, any gift funds if you're getting any gifts from family. Uh, we'll go over that more in detail once you have. Oh, that's the end of that work. That's the end of this lecture. Wow. Okay. So let's let's talk about the ACI. I started talking about that earlier. When you sit before a loan officer, there are three things, and I can actually turn the light on because I'm actually done with the PowerPoint. Uh, I think she just slid it up, I think, uh, or pushed it, or yeah. Oh, okay. It's a very, right. <laughs> Very important conversation that you're going to have with the loan officer. Uh, initially, up front, they need to determine whether you are homeowner ready or you're ready to go through the process before they enter any information in the system. Of course, we as loan officers, we can't discourage you from applying for a mortgage loan, but we want to get, you know, like a, we want to do a quick evaluation of where you are at this point. So if you call me or any other loan officer, there are three things that we're gonna discuss on the phone, and I like to call them ACI. It's gonna be your asset, do you have any available funds for closing costs or down payment? Your credit, we need to know what your credit score is. If you've looked at it recently, what the credit score is, if you've had any late payments in the most recent 12 months, do you have any unpaid charge off and collections uh, reflecting on the credit report, any repossession bankruptcies, we're gonna go through all of that. And then income, of course, which is very important. Uh, we need to know that you have the ability to repay back this loan. So income, we need to make sure that you have had a steady job for at least 24 consecutive months without any unemployment gaps greater than 30 days. So I am going to ask for like W2s for 2017, W2s for 2018, and I'm going to need uh, two pay stubs. So when we have our conversation, if you come through me, and I hope you do, <laughs> we're going to have a conversation. You may have, and you may hear me say, "Okay, I need your two by two by twos. I need two pay stubs, two W twos, and two bank statements." And I'll say that a lot. I need your two by two by twos uh, and, a, and, a, and a, a copy of your driver's license as well. Now, with regions, I love it. You can actually take a picture of your driver's license and your documents and send it over to me, and I can pull it from. My, I can send a message from my cell phone to my laptop, and I can create your file just by the picture. So if I need something, you don't have to go to a fax machine and try to upload it and send it over to me. Just take a picture of it, make sure all four corners of the page is in that photo, send it to me in a text message, and I got it from there. So um, on the assets, like I said earlier, what we're really looking for is we want to make sure that your wages, your, your monthly wages are directly deposited into your bank account. Every two weeks, first 15, every week, however you get paid, we want to see that your wages are directly deposited into that account. We need to make sure that there's no outside finance, financing from outside or any kind of income from outside that's coming into your bank account. So that any large deposits or withdrawals, I will ask you, you know, what is this about? Where did this come from? Is this a roommate type situation where everybody's paying half the rent? And we, we have to clearly explain to the underwriter, the government agencies, where this money came from. Uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of money laundering that's going on, and people who can't explain certain things in the bank statement, so we have to make clear to the underwriter, to the government agency, that there's no money laundering activity going on in your bank statement. So, Everything has to be documented in your bank statement. If you have twelve hundred dollars coming in from Arkansas, Seven, yeah. yeah, we need to see that you actually work from Arkansas Heart Center or whatever. Okay, no crazy stuff. I'm sorry, you had a question. Um, so say I have 
a full time job uh-huh. I'm employed, but uh-huh. I also sell hair on okay. the side. Should I get two separate accounts just so I don't have to have so much to explain on my bank statement? So that you said you, you do hair, sell hair. Sell hair. Yeah. So that's like your business? Yeah. So if we're not, I mean, so that's like your business, your legit business. So if we're not including any of your business, self employed income in your loan amount, we don't necessarily need that. However, we will have to explain it. If the money is in that, yeah, that primary account, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Does that apply to, you know, um, occasional deposits like school refund checks, income tax checks, Those, stuff that comes on a regular basis, but it's still once? maybe twice a year. Yes, that would have to be documented and we have to do a letter of explanation for it. Even though in your bank statement it may say $1,000 refund from the IRS, whatever, we'll need to see the documentation, your tax returns to show, hey, refund of $1,000. Uh, in some cases, a, a, a copy of the council check that they sent to you or if it was direct deposit. And then we'll need to do a letter of explanation, hey, this. $1,000 or $1,200 deposit into my checking account was from my tax returns for 2018. It has to be very detailed. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is it just deposits of, of a certain amount, like once it gets to a certain amount, or is it any, like, outside deposits? Like, I may need to borrow a couple dollars and can y'all send me $30 one week, or, you know, my mama send me $10, $15. Right. Does all of that have to be explained? The guideline says lump sum deposits or withdrawals. Now, what may be considered a lump sum deposit or withdrawal for me may be something totally different if you go to another lender. Mm-hmm. I want to see documentation of any deposit that's $200 or more. Okay. Okay? And especially if it's on a consistent basis. I need to know if, if you have a roommate that's, been, that's giving you their half of the rent and then you write in a check for the full rent, anything $200 or more, I'm going to question you about what, what is this, what exactly is going on, especially if it occurs in both bank statements. Because remember, I'm going to get two bank statements, two months of bank statements. If I see it in, what is this, August, if I see it in July and I see it again in August bank statement, I'm definitely going to ask, what, what is this? But if it's like a, a cash out for $30 from somebody or $50 from somebody, you know, I may look at them and move on. But $200 or more, I'm, I'm going to need to know what this is so I can explain it to the underwriter. Hey, you know, this is what's going on. They cut grass for the summer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're not including this income, but, you know, they cut grass this summer. So I'm going to pay them $200. And you know, we do that. And you see what I'm saying? So, um, really, just don't, if you can, why are you going through the home buying process? Avoid any lump sum deposits or withdrawals unless it's a gift from family. Now, if it's a gift from family where they're contributing to like the closing costs of down payment for your home, that's fine. We just have to make sure that we are following the correct steps with doing that. Number one, we cannot source cash. So if your family is giving you a cash gift, they need to really convert it over to a check money order, whatever, before they give it to you. A check, a money order, some some paper trail document. And when you get it, you will need to make a copy of it. Or if it's a check, go ahead and sign the back of it and send it, deposit it into your account. But when you come see me, I'm going to need an image of that council check. I need to make, I need to see who the donor was that gave me the money. And I need to be able to connect the dots, okay? So, they got twelve hundred dollars out of their bank account, or they wrote twelve hundred dollar check to you. You deposited the full twelve hundred in your account. I see it in your bank statement. The letter of explanation was on the right, uh, indicated that you know my sister gave me twelve hundred dollars for the purchase of my home. I would need donor's bank statement, your bank statement, and letter of explanation and a copy of the council check. It's a lot. It, it, it is a lot, but we have to clearly identify where that money came from to ensure that there's no money laundering. Any questions about any of that? Before you apply for a loan, you want to make sure that your job is, is steady. You've been on it for at least two years, or you have steady employment for two years. <coughs> it's the type of job where you, you may teach, substitute teach over here, and then the temp agency may send you over here to do some janitorial service, and then you may go over here and do something else. It needs to be a steady job. Relationship.
remember, we have to prove to these government agencies that you have the ability to repay back this loan. All right? Any questions from me at all? Home, the home buying process, a lot of people think it's a stressful process, but it really, it really is. It should not be, it should be smooth sailing. So that's the reason why I wanted to, you know, you know, present this PowerPoint presentation to you all to kind of, you know, remove some of that stressful confusion, stuff that confusing things that you may encounter as you go purchase a home. Because a lot of people just don't, they don't know, they don't know all the components that it takes to close a deal. And a lot of people are going to be touching that file. I mean, me as a loan officer, I'm going to touch it. My process is going to touch it. The underwriter is going to touch it. The closing coordinator is going to touch it. So that's why we have letters of explanations. You have to explain it. So each person that touched the file will know exactly what's going on. Then outside of the lending, you still got your home inspector, you got the termite inspector, you got the appraisal, you got the homeowner's insurance, you got the survey people. There's a lot of a lot of entities that's involved in your one loan. And it could it could be stressful. It really can. But me as a loan officer, your real estate agent, we are here, we work for you. We're trying to make or we will make this transaction as smooth and as stress as stressless as possible. It will not be stressful for you. That's our job to make sure that it's not stressful. Okay. All you really have to do is, or you should do, is just get really, out. Yeah, just shop for a home, find the one that you want, and then we will take it from there. Now, I will contact you, in fact, a minimum of nine times through the transaction. That's a part of my nine point communication plan. I reach out to the your real estate agent, your real estate agent, I'll reach out to you and the real estate agent on the other end to make sure that everybody's in the loop. I'm gonna do that by phone. Then I'm gonna follow up with an email and say, per our conversation, <laughs> this is what we talked about. So this is there's gonna be a lot of communication uh, back and forth between you and I because I want to make sure that you know what step you are in the process every step of the way. So if I if I get on your nerves, it's just that I'm doing my job, I have to contact you at least nine times throughout the process. Sometimes it's sometimes it's more. But you just let me know what your preferred method of communication. If it's text message, I'm a texter. I love it. You know, you just push that speak over your phone, you just speak out loud and it types the text message for you and you say send and it just sends it. You don't have to sit there and now, I am a big text, but if you prefer email for documentation purposes, I understand. I always follow up with an email, or if you want to speak directly to me by phone, I'll do that as well. All right. Any questions? Anybody? That's basically uh, it. Um, if there, if you think of any questions later, I would love to give you my cell phone number. I'm always available. I don't. Yes, I do have some business cards. I'm always available. I do not have office hours, so I work on weekends. As you can see, I work on weekends and holidays. Just shoot me a text, give me a call. I'm always available to answer any questions. My emails come to my cell phone, so you can email me if you like. Um, like I said, I'm here to make this uh, mortgage transaction as smooth as possible. And I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I know this is a Saturday yeah, afternoon. Understanding that Charlie last night Wilson is in town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to give you a last minute ticket. <laughs> a part of my birthday shenanigans, my birthday was on Wednesday, so. Oh, happy I belated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, uh, yeah, I know, but you know, after you've had 29 birthdays, the 30th birthday, this doesn't seem that exciting. <laughs> right. Why is you saying? Well, y'all don't believe in the birthday. <laughs> Lies you tell. Um, Mommy, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this incredible information. Um, a lot of y'all may not even be in the process of buying a home loan, but this information, if you've taken notes, you go back and watch this video, it will make your process so much smoother to when you are actually trying to buy a home. You know what things to not do as far as your credit. You know what things to start doing when you're six months out to find a home, a year out to find a home. You know that you need to find your job that you want to stick with for at least two years and 30 days after closing. And um, 
you know, you know, you need to have your bank in order for at least two months. You need to have those transactions and those um, statements clean and presentable so that you can secure this loan. Um, as he said, the loan officer, his job is to make the loan process as easy as possible. My job as a realtor is to make the home buying and the negotiations and with the inspector, the appraisal, and all of that jazz, make sure that in your documentation as far as your contract is smooth sailing and to the best benefit of you, my client. I can be reached at, at 501-563-2477 if you're interested in starting your home buying process. Um, email is Marion O'Hara at gmail.com. I am a licensed realtor with Innovative Realty, and I'll be more than happy to help you all find your dream home. Y'all have a great Saturday. And if anybody needs the slides, you can contact me on. I can send it in the uh, attachment. Oh, my contact information cell phone, area code 501 909 62 Five nine. My email address is Dion Davis. That's D E O N dot Davis at regions dot com. And I can send this to you uh, if you need it. Call me anytime. I'm always available. I love text messages. I will respond. But you can call. Me. Of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like to say thank you again to Deanna and Mary. Really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy schedule and sharing this valuable information with us. We have a few door prizes for the mommy say, hey, I'm going to make you get up. I'll pass them out. Okay? <laughs> so thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies. Oh, oh. oh. It's a baby. You guys feel free to take extra snacks with the babies. All right. All righty. I don't know how to. Thank you so much, mommies. Those that watched, those that physically came and joined us, all to y'all. We appreciate you. <laughs> Me and my big baby, we appreciate you. We will see you later this week. Come on in here, girl. We'll see you all later this week. We will post some good stuff. I will take a picture of Dion's card and put it in the comments here. I will also um, list his contact information as well as Ms. Marion's information. And that's it. We'll be back at schedule time next Friday. And yes. we'll let you know this what the topic, topic is. It'll be. We don't know yet. Mm, I think we're, this, this actually concludes the financial series. So, um... We got to see what we're going to talk about next week because I'm tired of talking about money. <laughs> I'm tired of talking about money. But we will see y'all next week. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful Saturday and a safe and blessed weekend. We love you. We love you. We love you. Mwah.